All right, everybody, welcome to Majors in Quinn. Thank you so much for taking the time out to come and join us this evening. We are so thrilled to have Mindy Grayling and Bruce Aria, two wonderful authors, with us tonight, not only because we're celebrating the one-year anniversary of Mindy's book launch, but also because it is Mental Health Awareness Week, and Sunday is World Mental Health Day. Um, so we just wanted to announce that if people can go to um, www.nami, that's N-A-M-I dot org for more information about mental health awareness. Um, Mindy Grayling has served in the House of Representatives in Minnesota for 20 years, including after her son was diagnosed with schiz schizoaffective disorder, Jim is joining us this evening, hi, um, in 1999. She initiated the first state bipartisan mental health caucus where legislators worked together to pass legislation including allocating most annual funding for mental health in Minnesota history up to that date. She has served on the national state uh, and state national alliance on mental illness, NAMI board, and currently serves on the University of Minnesota psychiatry, psychiatry, excuse me, community advisory council. Bruce Ario made a decision to be a writer when he met with another homeless man in the library in 1983. Previous to being homeless, Bruce, Bruce had completed two years of law school. The man asked, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Bruce thought and then wrote something that had been in his heart since childhood. I want to be a writer. The man smiled and then said, go do it. Bruce was seeking justice. He learned how the law students dealt with it, but was on a different mission than most of them. He tells stories of justice in his poems, plays, and novels. He hopes that his stories are inspiring. Ones where justice is served, um, justice served is universal, but not without shades of gray. All right, so before I hand it off to these two, um, we will be having their discussion and then followed by a quick Q&A for about the last 15 minutes of the event. After that, um, I'll take you two up to the glass case you, pay, you passed on your way in, uh, and they'll be signing copies of their books if you'd like wish to purchase either of them. And if you purchase them, not only are you supporting two amazing authors, but you are also supporting a small local bookstore and helping keep our doors open. So we really appreciate you for doing that if you wish, or, you know, just for joining us this evening. So with that, Bruce and Mindy. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, my brother, Kevin, and my Paula. Uh, fashion week. <laughs> I am going to start out with talking about the prevalence of mental illness. And uh, I'm going to throw some facts, facts and figures at you, and also uh, a couple uh, sidelights. All right. One, this is according to uh, NAMI, uh, NAMI information. One in five of you adults experience a mental illness. Nearly one in 25 million adults in America live with a serious mental illness. One half of all chronic mental illness begins by the age of 14, three quarters by the age of 24. 1.1% of the population, that's 2.4 million people, this is I believe these are 215 statistics, 2015. Uh, one in 100, 2.4 million adults with a schizophrenia. That's my diagnosis. And that's Jim's, Mindy's son's diagnosis, schizoaffective to be exact. Um, 2.6 live with bipolar, 6.9 live with depression, and 18% uh, live with anxiety disorders. It's not surprising that mental illness is depicted in media, sometimes favorably, but oftentimes unfavorably. I have an example of a movie, it's called Me, Myself, and Irene, and it's about a schizoaffective uh, man, it's played by uh, Jim Carrey, and uh, we all know his sense of comedy. I usually like him, but I don't know if I like him in this role because he depicts mental illness as kind of a bad thing, kind of off the wall, 
people doing crazy things, doing really crazy things, going and out and you know interrupting interrupting the general flow of society. He's a troublemaker, and that's oftentimes what we see in media. And uh, Nami has spoken out against this movie. best thing you can do when you see something like that is just take it in. Take it in. See what it says. And then maybe get busy writing your state legislature. Let, let's say like me. <laughs> 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 and uh, and uh, um, you know, tell them what you think. You know, our, we're, we're here to present a different picture of mental illness. We're here to put a different face on mental illness. And uh, I don't necessarily like it. It makes me kind of uncomfortable. I've, I've gotten a thicker skin about it, but uh, it seems like, you know, that's out there. Mental illness are zoned, people you, people you shun, people, not even shun, but people you make fun of, for goodness sakes. Somebody with an illness making fun of them, if you sit and make fun of somebody for breaking their leg, you know, uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And then there's the problem of homelessness. And uh, in January 2015, uh, the extensive survey found that there were 564,708 people who were homeless on a given night in the United States. Depending on the age group in question and how homelessness is defined, the consensus estimate as of 2014 was that at a minimum 25% of the American homeless have a mental illness, a serious mental illness, and 45% uh, have a mental illness. Um, so they often go hand in hand. They did in my case. I was homeless. I was homeless six months on the streets of Minneapolis. Experience I won't wish on my worst enemy. Um, and then there is there is the uh, phenomenon of a dual diagnosis. That's true of me. I, I I'm also in recovery from alcoholism. I do the gym right here too. And. Uh, that, that there's 9.5 million people in the United States as of 2019 that experience the dual diagnosis. And what can be done about that is treatment, and you treat both illnesses. I, uh, I keep them separate in my life. I keep the alcoholism and the mental illness separate because I understand them differently. And, uh, but they're both uh, illnesses, and uh, they both can raise serious problems in your life. Uh, what did you say, Mindy? Who's going first here? Well, while you're, while you're looking that up, <laughs> I will just say that, um, first of all, Thank you to everybody who's here. We really appreciate it that you came to, to learn more about mental illness or a lot of people here know a lot about it. So to tell stories with us and listen and converse. And when I first met Bruce was when I was quite at a loss because Jim, who has, by the way, not alcoholism, but has been a, a crack user for six years, um, but now he's doing wonderfully. So congratulations to Jim. Um, uh, when the book ended, things were not as good as they are right now, but he's been sober for three years and is working, and um, so I'm really proud of him. But back when he was first sick, and he had, you know, everybody often has some struggling years. We were homeless for six months, and yeah. families don't know what to do, so they might try tough love or or they try to get resources or get educated. 
but it takes a while, often a couple years, to stay on your meds and know what you need to do and realize you have an illness. And some people, unlike Bruce and Jim, never do. They just always never quite know they have a mental illness and then families and they suffer for a very long time. But when um, Jim first started doing better, he got into Tasks Unlimited, which I know there are other people here in the audience that know about that, or anyone who's read um, either one of our books would know about that. And that is a wonderful organization where people live in nice homes, work, and, and have friends. And so when Jim was first there, and he still was tentative, we hadn't got him out of the training lodge yet, um, John Trepp, who was the head of Tasks Unlimited at the time, invited Roger and me to a party. And I think he had an ulterior motive because he knew we were struggling. He brought, introduced us to Bruce Ariel, <laughs> who um, was the healthy person. This was like over 20 years ago, tw almost 25 years ago, I think. And Bruce was, I thought he was one of the staff that was there because he was so healthy and articulate and obviously very bright. And, um, and you were just such a role model that you gave me huge Hope, and I thought I didn't. I wasn't sure. I'm Jim, not sure how we do that. I <laughs> mean yourself, but um, but we weren't quite sure, even meeting you, that you weren't the exception, and that we would have trouble getting Jim up to that level. So um, I was still a doubting Thomas um, even after meeting you, but now I have to say Jim is doing doing really well too. So you gave us hope. Um, I'm, I'm so happy you say that and that maybe that's true, that's great. Uh, I, I, I was given hope, uh, started with my father and uh, the doctors were not too positive. The one I had at the psych ward, the first one, he was a young, just starting out, I think it was his first assignment and he didn't give me much hope at all. But my dad got in my face and said, hey, you got a good mind. And I was saying to myself in my head, Dad, if you only knew what I'm going through. But I didn't say anything. I, I, I took that as kind of uh, a prognosis by my parents. And uh, I decided that I was gonna try to live up to that. I had, I had the experience with an angel and that gave me great hope that there was something greater than this mental illness. Now, something out there beyond mental illness. And I could see the doctor was beyond mental illness. The people on the psych wards, not so much. They were pretty trapped um, by their illnesses. And, uh, but I was determined. I was determined to break that chain, break out of that. And uh, um, it really hit me hard, though. Because uh, and that's the problem. The problem was mostly stigma for my for me. Uh, I didn't want to be labeled mentally ill. It was I took it as an insult, and uh, I didn't take it as an illness. I took it as a doctor insulting me. And uh, and it's the way he diagnosed me. He came into the room. He stuck. A, safety pin on my toe, he had me remove my shoes and my socks. He stuck a safety pin on my toe a couple times, asked me maybe three or four questions. And then I said, doctor, I am seeing an angel. I don't think I belong on this psych ward. I, I, have, I have an angel, I can figure this out. He goes, you are schizophrenic. And he said it in that tone. I go, whoa, what did he just, what did he just lay on me? What, 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 you know, I, I felt the separation, a wall go up between my, my whole life and, and now he was the one calling my shots. And uh, it didn't settle right with me. Uh, if I had been a different doctor, it could have been a much different story for me. But that's how it got started, is in an antagonistic relationship with my psychiatrist. And then I had a good one. The second one was a lot smoother and he tried to smooth things out. Um, I don't want to get too far ahead of my situation, 
Um, but anyway, there are good psychiatrists. There, there are ones, I wouldn't call him bad. I wouldn't call my first psychiatrist a bad person. He was just young and he got excited and that's the way he reacted. We, we had a competition between us rather than the doctor-patient relationship. And uh, as vulnerable as I was, I wasn't easy to compete with somebody with a medical degree. And it was a very uneven power struggle for many years. One, one other thing I like about Bruce is um, his working with his family. And you know, a lot of times people in the mental health system get paranoid about their families or their families don't handle their illness well and then they get estranged and um, the family is often pushed away in the mental health system. Uh, we don't um, talk to you because we're just talking to the person with the mental illness when actually NAMI teaches and the evidence-based practices tell us that families and the people with mental illness do better if they work together. And that's why I like Pass Unlimited because they work with families, work with um, people with mental illness, and it takes everybody to have success. And then NAMI, the same. NAMI is people with mental illness and families and professionals. And so I think this, having been a legislator, I, I think the strongest um, mental health groups are those where people work together. And I love how Bruce <laughs> talks about his parents, I think it was your dad, who kind of gave him a kick in the butt, you know, don't be sorry for yourself, you know, get out there and do well, we still expect things from you. <laughs> Am I getting that right, Bruce? Absolutely. Uh, my dad, uh, uh, my dad uh, told me in on certain terms that I was not welcome in the house anymore. I would get in, I got in a fight with Kevin. I was very, very hard to deal with, and I was struggling with coming out of a two-year stint in law school and then having to leave law school with, a, with an incomplete degree. And that was, that's been the single biggest failure in my life. I mean, realistically, in the real world. I mean, I've had some personal failures too, but in the real world, which is visible to everybody, I started out to become a lawyer and I didn't make it. And so I was, I was mad. No, I, I couldn't, I wasn't strong enough at that time to just say, hey, so what, go on. And that's what my dad wanted me to do, is just <coughs> forget it. You know, my dad said, I'm no longer a teacher. I was a teacher 30 years, but that's in the past. I'm a different person now. And you're not a lawyer, you're not a student, you're not, you're, you, gotta be, you gotta think up something new. <laughs> <laughs> and it's tough love is right, it was. My mother was much the same way. Uh, they, they said, no, we're not gonna let you uh, hang out in the house and just whittle <coughs> away your life in our basement, drinking your beer and listening to your rock music and feeling <laughs> sorry for yourself that you didn't make it through law school. We're not gonna let you do that. And so uh, I became homeless. <coughs> I was out on the streets and you learn quick the ways of the world when you're homeless. And I tried really hard not to think of myself as homeless or permanently homeless. Um, I tried to figure out ways I could break. And my biggest, my biggest hope, well the angel was my biggest hope, the angel I had seen. But my second biggest hope was Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, I thought, man, that guy, they're calling me crazy, but look at him and he's, he's a star. <laughs> he's, 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 people respect him. People love him. Why can't I do that? I might have a condition in my mind, but so does Dylan. Look what he's done with his life. And he's never been diagnosed as mentally ill, but that's kind of, you know, I tried to understand him uh, that way sometimes, you know, like uh, compare myself to him. And uh, but he gave me great hope. Um, and. Uh, Eventually, I ran into that person that we mentioned at the start, Stephanie mentioned. I ran into another homeless man, and I was kind of misguided, you know, didn't know what I was going to do. Just all I could think about was he didn't make it through law school. He didn't, 
all your dreams to become a lawyer, what you had worked for from sixth grade on, and it's just gone now. Uh, what are you going to do? And I ran into a homeless man, and he goes, oh, so you were in law school, huh? And I go, yeah. And he goes, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I began to tell him. I said, well, I want to. And he goes, shh, shh. Write it on this piece of paper. Write it on this piece of paper. And he handed me a piece of paper and a pen. So it was an intimate, you know, so I wasn't just telling the world at that time. It was me and him. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I wrote, I want to be a writer. And then he said, go do it. I can still see him to this day. Thank God for him. Because that, then I had... And then the wheels began to spin a little bit, slowly, very, very slowly, but um, and in some ways it was almost erratic, but I had a new dream, become a rager. I had a new dream. He had, he had helped me, give me the, back, the backing to do that, and uh, so, uh, but then I panicked on the streets, and I took off all my clothes. And I made a spectacle out of myself, something I've had to live down for many, many years now. And I basically received with ostracism, but in my mind, I thought, I am going to test this angel. I am going to test her, and I'm going to bring back the Garden of Eden. And everybody's going to take their clothes off <laughs> after they see me do it. And you don't test God. You just don't <laughs> test God. <laughs> especially that way, and uh, nobody did. They looked at me with disgust and disbelief, and some s were sifting, and one guy smiled at me. One guy, I could still see his face. He smiled, you know, with that kind of that male thing that guys do with each other. He, he gave me a smile at my worst, probably my worst public moment ever, without a doubt. Without a doubt, it was. And worst public moment, and he was able, he didn't know how much that smile meant to me. One friendly face out of 150 faces, and it meant something to me. And uh, so I've become a writer. That's where, I'm, where I am today. And um, I think what just Bruce just shared with us is a common phenomena of many people with serious mental illness, that people start out with dreams maybe that they've had since childhood of what they want to do, what they want to become, and then um, you have to think of something new. And that's, Bruce and I have a lot of laughs when we're together. <laughs> I have a beer, he does not because he's a recovering alcoholic, but we, whether we had any beer or not, we just have a lot of laughs because he's taken a positive attitude and um, and is, has become something else. A happy person not being a lawyer. You might have escaped having to be a lawyer. That's I sometimes <laughs> think <laughs> after that. <laughs> and, um, and then the other thing he shared that I think is also a common uh, phenomena, and I write about these things about Jim. You know, that's one thing we discovered. You know, a lot of the things that that we experienced, me as a parent, and Jim and Bruce as people with um, with schizophrenia, is that we have a lot of lot of things in common. And one of the others, then, besides having to change what you planned, you know, all your life, or maybe went to school for, because often people get sick when they're in college or shortly afterwards, and they they're going to do one thing and then they're doing another. Uh, the other thing that's common is you mentioned taking off all your clothes and being embarrassed and, and then that one smile, somebody smiled and that just made all the difference. And I think, um, you know, most people with serious mental illness, until they get straight on picking what meds they need or what care they need or what support, have probably done something embarrassing. And I know Jim has, and some I wrote about in the book, and some I spared him and didn't write about in the book, because I figured if he wants to share those, he can. Yeah. And, but I think um, it's all very, a very common thing. And until I started talking to people through my work in the legislature and sharing our story, I didn't realize 
how common some of these things were. You know, everybody thinks they're all the only one and they're suffering all by themselves, when in fact, um, it's just a very common experience. And uh, that's, I think, what part of what we're trying to get across. Yeah, um, you know, my, I, I wish everybody could be mentally ill for one day, just to know that it's not, it's not what you think it is. Um, mental illness is on a, gra a gradient, and it's not something, the doctors almost make you think either you're mentally ill or you're not. It, it's on a spectrum, and you cross over the line, and they call you mentally ill, and you go, is this really what insanity is? This isn't really all that bad. <laughs> but all the stigma, all the stigma that you, that it's thrust upon you, yeah. oh, you're mentally ill, huh? The doctor diagnosed you. And that's who people listen to is the doctors. That's who people listen to sometimes is the doctors. And the doctors don't know themselves because they've never been there, but they have all these ideas conjured up in their heads about what it is, and uh, they've learned it in books, and you know, some people are greatly helped by that. I was less so. I, w I followed my dad, you know, and he directed me to a Christian lifestyle and a life of reason. No, he, I was, I shunned reason. Bob Dylan shuns reason. He's a very unreasonable guy. And I, I tried to do what he did. <laughs> he never took his clothes off, though. But anyway, um, I, uh, I shunned reason. And my dad has convinced me just by his example, even in his death, he died some time ago, 10 years ago now, over 10 years. But I still think of him, and he was always the reason. He had questions for me. He saw me before I went in the psych ward, and he had a lot of questions for me. And I was filled in them, and he was nodding his head, but I knew, I mean, I didn't know at the time, but I could see that it didn't make much sense to him, but he was trying to understand it from his stance of a reasonable man. And I, at times, told him I thought I was the second coming, and he really didn't like that. And uh, um, he was reasonable. And that's kind of where I, where I found my salvation, is trying to be reasonable. I found it by trying to do obey the law, strict. I've been kind of strict in many ways with myself. And uh, I don't want to destroy my art. Terry probably doesn't think this reason thing is so great. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, most artists do. And, uh, but I needed it because uh, I, I do believe I had some kind of chemical thing going on that was bigger than me that I could control that was killing me, and I had to get help. I have a topic, I don't know if we have it on our list or not, but I just knowing who's here and, and knowing you, I would like to discuss a little bit, and that is employment. And often um, doctors, you mentioned doctors, used to um, discourage people with serious mental illness from working. You know, you're too sick or you're it would be too stressful for you. You might as well give up and not even work. That's exactly the message I got, was getting. <laughs> that was what you were getting. And so, and now, even in 2021, 86% um, of people with serious mental illness want to work and less than 10% are. So I think, I'm very biased that work is therapeutic. It's something where you get self-respect. And I would like to um, have you address that, the, I, the how you felt when they were discouraging you from working, and then how important it is to you now. Let me just say, my, uh, my sense of self-esteem was something like an earthworm, and uh, I didn't have much, but my dad, my dad uh, was in my corner, and I knew it, and my brothers, Kevin and my other two brothers, were in my corner, my friends were in my corner. Everybody, Jim was, that told me he was pulling for me. Everybody was pulling for me, and I kind of knew that. 
even though I, the doctors were knew, were aware of how weak and fragile my mind was, I had the belief that I could strengthen my mind if I just tried hard enough, if I just gave it my all, quit focusing on the pain, concentrate on reason, concentrate on the positive. And I didn't, I, I tried that, but truth is I wasn't too effective. I lost three jobs in a row right out of, when I came out of my group home and it wasn't looking good. And then my social worker said, okay, Bruce, how about this task unlimited? Let, let's give that a try. And I said, wait a minute, that's blue collar. I was a lawsuit. And he goes, Bruce, you know, you were always talking about that the working class, there was a pride there and a sense of pride. And why can't you be one? And I thought for a moment, yeah, why can't I? So I went into task and they taught me how to work. They taught me how to work. I had had people, even when I was homeless, I had people telling me, shout out the window, get a haircut or, you know, you don't want to work, what's wrong with you? You know, um, those kind of messages kind of strengthened me because I knew those people weren't trying, that wasn't that they were making fun of me, they were trying to encourage me to get backbone and get up and work. Well, I ran into a good organization in Task Limited that gave me that backbone, got behind me, uh, believed in me, uh, not that I was Jesus, but that I was Bruce Ario and I had some talent. I had some talents that I could use. And they got behind me, and uh, I had some hard moments, uh, some moments of truth with clients and, and uh, <coughs> with myself. But I just knew I was working and making a paycheck. And that was blue collar. And I remember when I worked on the railroad, and I remember the guys I worked with, and I thought, these guys would be proud of me. I'm blue collar like they are. <laughs> You know, and I was always college boy when I was on the railroad. And uh, in fact, I ran into my foreman at one point, uh, some years down the road after I had been in task and he said, I remember you say you ended up in the uh, mail room, huh? And I said, yep. And he goes, that's fine. And uh, so I began to get positive messages. I needed those, because I had gotten so many negative messages especially from the doctor. But I was getting negative messages from life itself. I, I was reading people as hating me, disowning me, hating me, I hated myself. I was reading, that's how I was reading it, as one big competition. And that's what law school, that's what some lawyers live life like. Everyone's competitive, it's me only against the world. And that's kind of what Bob Dylan does a little bit, although he's a little bit more, uh, he has a few more friends than that, but, uh, and he's got a lot of fans. And, um, but uh, I thought the world hated me, and it took a long time for people's love to break through. And I remember on my mother's deathbed, you know, I was kind of still in this, kind of this frame of mind, the whole world hates me, Mom. And she just shook her head and I could just see she loved me. She could break through. She knew I had to be stronger than that. I wasn't gonna get everybody to come up to me and shower me with flowers and <laughs> you know and put me on stage where I sang out my tribulations. And uh, she knew I had to be tougher than that. And uh, but she wasn't gonna tell me she hated me. And that was maybe one of the few people that I, I felt that. You know, the world can be a pretty cold place, and so I'm trying my best not to make it. But I know how tough you got to be in this life, and you can't, you can't, you can't take, you can't uh, sympathize to the point where you make the other person a beggar or weak. You got to live with pride. You have to take love strong. You have to take love, grasp it, and live with it. And live strong. That's what you got to do. You have to. You have to take love strong. That's a really positive attitude. And, the, you know, you mentioned feeling like nobody liked you or worrying about 
even your mother and what she thought of you. And that's another thing that I write about that um, Jim went through. And I think that's all of us in life, you know, have doubts and wonder if people like us or are we all we should be and we want people to like us. But I think people with mental illness suffer from that more than other people because of the self-doubt and what society thinks about people with mental illness that you've talked about so eloquently. And, um, and then just internal. So if you have delusions or hallucinations or you have thoughts that, that people don't like you, um, that's something I know, you know, Jim said he didn't wanna talk today, he wants to listen to us, but I did write about that and he definitely has thought that a lot, that people don't like him. And actually people like Jim yeah. and they like I you. like Jim. Yeah, <laughs> and so um, it's, it's uh, something that everyone struggles against, but people with mental illness, I think, have to struggle with it a lot more. A little bit more, yeah. Should we read from our books before sure. we run out of time? Because I right. know they're gonna cut us off for questions one of these days. Do you wanna go first? Sure. <laughs> Then one night, I had an experience that would change my life totally. I was driving downtown Minneapolis at breakneck speed, dead drunk on the night when I found out that a former girlfriend was now sleeping with a friend. And I had a terrible car accident. I ran into a stoplight. I cracked the windshield of the car with my forehead while racing with that new boyfriend of my ex-girlfriend. I was never quite the same after that. My thinking became much more desperate. In quick succession, I had a religious experience that would even more fully change my life. I sensed the presence of an angel, which gave me relief and direction in contrast to my psychological distress. The conflict in me grew, and I began taking psilocybin mushrooms to get a high. It wasn't all bad. In, in the city, one was faced with many angles of life, and one had to live out his own life as the best he thought he could. Even in unforeseeable events like car accidents, broken relationships, and angels. That's how I had thought of the city. It was a place, a geographical location, a place on earth where people live, a place that was stagnant and permanent. The hit on the head, the drugs, the breakup, and even the religious experience led me towards a crisis in my life, psychosis. I knew I was psychotic. When I was psychotic, I knew it. I knew I had crossed the line. I would have a new understanding of what a city boy was now. My mind was received, re recreating all the boundaries it once made. The city was really people. I realized that as I stepped out of the mental ward in the hospital where I had spent the last two weeks as a patient. I stood under the bright sun looking at the leaf-filled trees, watching the people walk by. I felt alone, but I sensed myself as one of many persons in kind of a play that featured us as actors and actresses of the city. It should have been obvious to me before but now I really understood there was no city without people. I felt, I felt a certain lack of resolve, but now my lack of resolve was so poignant that I became resolved in a different way. I took my experience as a spiritual one. I was a born again Christian. I was uncomfortable, but years of drinking and drugs had turned me into a psychologically experienced person. I could handle mental change. Very nice. And I, um, I picked two short sections about um, psychosis as well. And um, I'm gonna, one of them is from my viewpoint, and the other one is from Jim's viewpoint of what he told me about what was going on. So this is um, five years before I knew what was going on in Jim's head. Why'd you call the police, Jim? He is accusing me, he's in the psych ward and trying to get him help and we ended up having to call the police, which you 
is unfortunately still one of the ways you have to get mental health access if in desperation. I took a gulp of air to keep you safe, to get you medical care. I'm not sick. He pursed his lips and blew air at me as if he were exhaling cigarette smoke. Then he spit into a nearby wastebasket, his way of purging me. They're torturing me here. No, they're not, honey. He glared at me. You're not my real mom, are you? I blinked back tears. You aren't my real son either, I shouted in my head. I should have married my soulmate. Then none of this would have happened. Jim loudly interrupted my silent shouting. And I'd be the new devil. I better be an angel like you have to be <laughs> devil. I'd be the new devil. He stared balefully at me for a long second and then stomped out. My throat swelled shut and I gasped to breathe. That was the first I'd heard of this. So I had no idea what was going on, but five years later, Jim told me. So we were walking around, um, around a lake in Minneapolis. Want to hear my delusion? Jim volunteered, his voice muffled in the high winds. Sure, my moist breath turned icy behind my scarf. You've told me some parts, but I'm interested in hearing the whole thing. He lit a cigarette and we started walking. In the beginning, there was only one God. He took a long draw of smoke, a female. She was supposed to work at rising through the levels of the universe. Nice the goddess female. When I laughed, my breath made my scarf momentarily wet until it froze again. It was a luxury to hear about Jim's delusion when he wasn't in the middle of it. I thought you'd like that part, he grinned. It was hard work and increasingly, as she got higher and higher, she could keep rising herself or create a male god to do the work for her. Eventually, though, she would have to kill him if she wanted to continue rising. He looked at me searchingly, and when I didn't react, he continued. So he went on to tell me all about his delusion, and I wrote some of it in the book because it was so long and convoluted, <laughs> I couldn't write the whole thing. But I really appreciate in reading your book and because it gave me even more insight and into I appreciate what's going on. hearing Jim's story. I mean, uh, that, that's who I am. That's the crow. That's that's my peer. That's who I work with. People with mental illness, and I've, you know, for good or bad, I've decided to accept that as as my lifestyle, my my way out and to uh, being an artist is. You know, because you can write what you say, and then if people don't like it, you say, well, well, he's mentally ill. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I think, yeah, yeah. That, this is a good breaking point. If Do you want to handle the questions? Is that how this works? Um, I mean, if you're comfortable handling them, it's, you know, fairly informal, just a conversation between all of us. Um, that's totally fine with me. Okay. We've got about 15 minutes to answer questions for people who are here. Matt. Yeah, you know, um, you know, in like movies and things, you, you kind of see the projection of mentally ill as kind of, mental illness is kind of dangerous, immoral, and fun. You know, and for some people it really is that way. And for some people they're, they're, they're kind of the opposite. They're very inhibited, you know. There's actually a huge diversity in, in schizophrenia itself and not to mention other mental illnesses I mean, how would how would you approach you know that kind of bias that that's the way schizophrenia is i think schizophrenics run the gamut there's every you know i used to try to figure out on psych wards when i first got on why is this person schizophrenic i mean he's a handsome intelligent guy why is she schizophrenic she's, she's got college education and then I began to believe what the doctors have that, at least they have, they have a lot, right? But they got that right. It runs across. It doesn't respect class, sex, race, age. It runs the gamut. Every type of person is susceptible to coming down and being diagnosed with a schizo with a, with a mental illness. You know, um, there's no one type. And I've had a lot of relief um, because it, it freed me up to understand that 
that's only one small part of my personality. I haven't joined a cult. I'm not. I'm not in Jonestown with Reverend Jim Jones. You know, I'm in Minneapolis. You know, doing my thing, and uh, I got a strong leader in George Fairweather, who I kind of have uh, adopted his ideas and kind of created kind of almost a force field of what I think my life should go like. And it's kind of like what he thought. And so I've adapted, I've learned. I, and I, I never had the humility to do that until the doctor labeled me with schizophrenia. And then I said, well, now that the the wells broke and the dams broke and the water's in, you know, I might as well examine a little bit more about my life and I don't have, people aren't going to expect me to have this, uh, this, I had always been right, I had, people always said you're too perfect, Bruce, you know, you're too nice a guy, you're too perfect, and, uh, but I knew I wasn't, I just didn't know what would happen and that's what happened. Might not happen without the car accident. I don't know. And uh, Jim had a snowboarding accident, and he thinks that's one of the factors in his schizophrenia as well. Are the the brain is a delicate, a delicate thing. It is. And Matt, I would say to your question too. Um, I once um, was at a reading by Esme Wang. I don't know if you've read her book, The Collective Schizophrenias, um, but she had as uh, Schizophrenia wrote a book like we did, and I was at one of her book readings at the Loft um, a couple summers ago when they had that outdoor festival, and somebody with bipolar disorder asked her in the Q&A for her book talk if she, this person said, I'm glad I have a mental illness. I um, feel like I'm a better person. I'm um, I'm more creative, and I just think it was a blessing that I got a mental illness, and, and what's your view on that? And Esme said, um, she did not, agree. she said, I respectfully do not agree, uh, because I, I've seen too much suffering from when I've been in the psych wards, and seen people who are, who are suffering with uh, mental illnesses that I just can't agree that I'm glad about it. Um, but I think, um, like Bruce said, everybody's different. So that was that was one answer. I do, what do you think, Bruce? You're, well, I, I mean, think I, I was going to ask Matt when he oh, thought. Yeah, what is Matt doing? Yeah, and then, if, right and then if you want to pass, Bruce is ready. Yeah, so. yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I just remember someone saying, like, you know, there's a story, like, every, every, you, every single brain injury is different. You know, I mean, I, my experience has been that, yeah, I work in a company that employs the mentally ill. And that they're like every person's mental illness is really unique. You know, it's it's you know, I mean, sometimes the med sometimes the meds don't even work. You know, it, it just, there's there's just no way to treat them. You know, it's just you know, I mean, it's so different between each person. You know, it's like a story almost. You know, it's not really um, yeah. Oh, they're like th there's no like oh they're always this way or they're always that way or. I was just going to say that um, to me, mental illness has just been a series of walls that I couldn't break down. And um, that's what made me sick is when I really got put up against the wall. And that's when I couldn't smile at people. That's what the traumatic brain injury did to me. I had too much pain in my mind that I wasn't able to have a natural conversation when I was tending bar. And it just snowballed. I mean, uh, you know, I interpreted that people didn't like me, and, and therefore, you know, they stopped liking me, and it just snowballed. And it mounted to the fact that I couldn't get through some walls. Well, now I've come around to thinking that might not be half bad, that I can't break down walls. You know, my hero, Bob Dylan, loves breaking down walls. There's women like Hillary Clinton that likes breaking the glass ceiling. Well, you actually break in other people's glass ceilings, and you're actually, you're actually uh, inciting other people, and 
where's the responsibility in that? You know, if you're shattering glass ceilings, you don't live in a vacuum. You're not in your own life. So I, I began to understand, try to figure out what are people's walls and how do they deal with them? How do they make it through those walls without losing that wall? And I came dangerously close to using my walls, dangerously close to losing my walls. And without my walls, uh, and it was my minister at church that really helped me out with that. You know, he, he talked about raising the walls and it's of ADM or there's some city and he talked about it a great thing, you know, to have walls in your life. And Robert Frost, the great poet, had walls make good neighbors. And uh, you can't, I, I had this notion from the 60s that we were all going to run around as airheads. And <laughs> you know, in the Garden of Eden. And that's, that's not, it's not going to, it's not really going to work that way. Humans aren't that way. You can see why Bruce was a good writer, because he taught stuff he writes. <laughs> Any other oh, questions? Oh, thank you, Mindy. Yeah, right here. Any other questions? Or comments? Bruce, I know you've talked in the Apple speech department before. Do you think they're better at handling situations with mentally ill people now that are sane or worse? I think they've gotten a lot of experience. I, I get... I have to tell this story because it's kind of me. I, I don't want to dominate, but I don't want to take up all Mindy's time either. I'll, I'll comment on the police. Well, well, I, I think, yeah, we're, I I think we're, we're totally hand in hand, and so I all think right. it's fair. I have to tell this story. Um, I spoke to every police officer in the city of Minneapolis, and they had a training where they were all required to go, and I was there at every speech giving my story. And so sometime in that period of time, or as shortly thereafter, I'm walking down the street and this police officer starts walking in my direction. Well, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I thought, he just, he's just walking, you know, he's got, but then it looked like he was coming right at me. And sure enough, he was. And he got right up next to me and I said, officer, I didn't do anything. I'm just walking home after work. <laughs> and he goes, no, no. I just wanted to tell you, I saw your speeches at, uh, at the uh, in-service, and you did a fantastic job. And now, when he's driving, to this day, I mean, I, I see him like every six months, and it's been, about, it's been about six months now since he's done this, but he will stop his car and get out to shake my hand. Oh, he will cool. get out of his car and shake my hand. And, uh, so, you know. So, so in honor of Dad, will you be voting? or against item number two on Minneapolis ballot? I'd definitely be voting to keep the police. I, I, uh, the police... Well, the type of questions my, her father would ask us at the dinner table. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think we need police. Um, there's enough individuals in serious trouble out there that could cause much worse trouble without the police. And I wish there was a someone to call that didn't involve the police a lot more often. And um, so I know there's a lot of talk of crisis teams or you know social workers coming out. And I think the more we can do you know, with early prevention and intervention, the better. But unfortunately, um, in the current society, we, if someone has anosognosia, which Bruce and Jim don't, but when Jim's using drugs, then sometimes he does. And that means he doesn't know he's ill. So he's not gonna himself seek help or accept help. And then you have to wait until the last dog is hung. And then uh, the social workers and the crisis team don't want to come without the police. And that's, so I'm not sure how we cut into that, um, but right now, it would be scary to me not to have the last resort if we need it. Uh, the last time that I called the police was, you know, Jim's been doing so well for three years, but for three, about three years before that, I did have to call them. And I'd already run through the crisis team, the people incorporated, mental health workers, and none of them would do anything because he was his own person and he wasn't voluntary and he didn't rise to that level. And then when he did, and he was you know, being kind of scary in our house and banging doors
Taylor is really hard and I, you know, they're pretty kind of jumpy. <laughs> then, um, then, uh, then they were the only ones left to call. So that's the part that really gives me pause is that the mental health system is not equipped to help people in time if they don't know that they're ill or don't acknowledge that they're ill. So I just think there have to be a lot of tools in the toolbox for, you know, what different situations are. And the best police are the ones that Bruce has trained. <laughs> well, you know, they try. They got a sad job I would ever want. Uh, it's a hard job. You, you get it from both sides. You get, you work your tail off to try to get criminals off the streets and into the courts, and then the courts turn them loose, and it's got to you know, it's, but that's oversimplified exactly what happened because as a lawyer, I would have been doing that, um, so I can't really knock it too much, but it's got to be heartbreaking for the police to just see what they, what they see in a typical day, if you can just imagine what they see in a typical day and what they're up against and how much praise they get from society, and now they defund them, I think I will make because I'm in the president of a state rep, I'm going to say this. I appreciate retired, people like, retired. Oh, okay, retired. <laughs> All right. Um, I think the city council has gone off the wall. Minneapolis city council is just, it's just off the wall, off the charts. And, uh, but there's some good, there's some good pe good politicians like Mindy and some of the others. and. Uh, Hopefully they can bring the people back. I'm more centrist. I like to see people working it across the aisle. I like to see people working together. I'm not an extremist. I was. I have been an extremist when I had to be, but I didn't really get that much satisfaction out of uh, that. And uh, um, yeah. Our board you spoke about. Um, there's saying like at one point you felt like you were an abuser or you didn't um, mm -hmm. you talked about you can sum that, that you talked about was it a god and my own father had a, was bipolar and I saw him a psychotic um, once and he also reverted to many religious references like he said his hearing aid was the way he communicated with God and the TV was communicating with God how common is when you're it's very common. A lot of people on the psych ward. I, I don't know how many Jesuses I've met. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I hate to say it. You know, Jesse Ventura would say that weak minded people seek religious answers. Well, there's some pretty gifted people that are devoutly religious. I don't. But when, the, when it hits a fan, um, who's there? to pick up the pieces, well, it's usually religious people, people with faith. They want to see you doing well. They believe that humans are good. They believe you, it's kind of a conundrum. They believe you're a sinner, but if you ask for forgiveness, then you're okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a conundrum, but it works. It works. I have a job. I have a income. I'm eating healthy. You know, I don't know why religious people go, I mean, why people with mental illness go that way, but uh, I, I have no answer for that. And, and it, it even has a name, it's called religiosity, and it's, um, it, is, it is common, like Bruce said, and so I don't know why, you know, delusions of grandeur is a symptom of many mental illnesses, certainly bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, and so, you know, delusions of grandeur on steroids makes you think you're a supreme being of some sort or very powerful or you can fly and so mm -hmm. it's part of, but the, nobody knows what causes mental illness and there's some genetic component and there's stress and there's, you know, poverty or uh, abuse or something different causes, but there is not a known cause. When we had the genome project, you know, 20 years ago or so, um, people like me thought, good, we'll finally find out what causes schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and serious mental illnesses, and then we can start working on what's the cure. 
but um, unfortunately there were almost 200 genes that were involved and so it's a constellation and everybody's different and maybe that's why people with mental illness are so different because they I know, have different causes. I know in my case I made a personal decision to follow my angel that I, I'm very religious now, I wasn't growing up at all, um, but that angel, she chose me, I, I believe, and it's, it may sound off the wall, and I'm fine to think it is, um, but she chose me, and I made a conscious decision to follow her and try to hear what she was trying to tell me. I made a conscious decision because it provided me hope. I was, I was coming out of a broken relationship, a car accident, with her new boyfriend that didn't look good, but this angel showed up, and I said, this is my ticket. I didn't jump up and down and go crazy thinking all of my happiness, because it was a lot of work. But uh, I thought, I chose it. I chose religion after the angel chose me. You mentioned hope, and now it's, I think we veered from our script, but maybe we should go back to our last question in our closing mm -hmm. and both talk about what gives us hope. I'm going to let you go first because you're the more eloquent of the two. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but you can go. You were talking to the uh, governor at the time, so. Um, anyway, what gives me hope is, uh, you know, in my, fond, in my biggest grandiosity, and I still can be grandiose, the doctors haven't totally wiped that from my life, I can, I can hope that Christ returns to earth. Maybe not in my lifetime, but it's a, something for me to work on, and something for me to work on what happens when I go before him after death, because I believe I will. I don't know if everybody does. I have no clue, but I, I have a strong feeling that it's going to happen for me, and it, I think there's an accounting, and that happens in life. Other people make us accountable to them, and we have, we have to be held accountable. I believe God operates the same way. What gives me hope is that I go to church, <laughs> I tithe, and I have a good job, and I try to be a good person. And I fall short many times, and some of the things I still yearn for, maybe God would have me do it differently. Um, my dad would probably have me do it differently. Um, but that's what gives me hope is religion. The grand, the, the grandest scheme of it is that Christ would return. Uh, I don't know what that even means. I haven't gotten that far yet. So I love it that you didn't even talk about mental illness in your hope. You know, we all there's no it. hope in mental illness. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I'm going to try to answer. But yes, there's, it's a it's a perplexing illness, a very tragic illness in many ways, and. Um, but what does give me hope about it is that here we are in a major bookstore in downtown Minneapolis and we're talking about it. You know, I think back when my, I read about my grandmother in this book and she went to the Rochester State Hospital in 1958 when I was 10 years old. And our family was, you know, we kids were told uh, it was nobody's business. We didn't need to tell the neighbors about it and they could just all, you know, hold their questions because we weren't gonna talk about it. It was considered shameful and we kept it in and then the hurt festered. So here we are, Bruce and I laugh about it and we talk about a lot of things besides mental illness, don't we? Yeah. And all the people here who are interested and um, are talking about it, learning about it, that gives me huge hope. And I have um, a granddaughter, Roger and I, my husband is here too, have a grand daughter or Jim's niece who's 17 and she actually made it her school project or one of her projects was to advocate for mental health services for teenagers. She lives in Washington DC and they went to um, went to the mayor's office. They didn't have a legislature in, in Washington DC so they could only go to the mayor's office. There was no capital um, and they, or they could go to the federal capital I guess. But um, I just think all this openness has got to lead to advocacy and lead to more research and more funding and better programs. And it's all, that gives me, gives me hope. Yeah, there, there is hope in mental health. But 
the hope is to go beyond it for me. That there's no joy in being on a psych ward with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or psychosis. There's just no joy there. There's no hope. You have to get the only hope is to get out of that condition. Mm -hmm. So there—that's the last word. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, I guess there's one more question. Yes. Uh, Andy, can I just say something? Sure. I, I should say this because the greatest hope in mental illness may be even greater than the angel would find somebody that could understand what I was going through, and that's what I found at Pasadena, is that people understand the illness. They understand what it's like to have that diagnosis. I, I found people that are up against the, the same wall as me, and I see how they deal with it. And I've watched you at work, and I've watched Matt, no, I, I uh, that means a lot to me. I found somebody that understands what's going on up here. Yeah, not they, not they everything. Look at them only just by looking at you. I don't know you just by looking at you, but there's a lot that people convey non-verbally. Let me tell you that, and that's that's just the way I take life. I I people when they use words and use their language, I think. There's a lot of room for misunderstanding, but when you when you watch people and see how they deal with others, then I think that's what you that's how that's how I take life, and that's what may help me thrive. And I think people who um, you know sometimes when you're doing really well, you have a mental illness and you're doing really well, and then it's maybe can be distressing to see someone who's not doing as well. So I always wish um, there were some way to to help people who aren't aren't doing as well. And I, one of the hopes I think for we're talking about the police too, uh, that p people who are peer specialists or people with mental illness, Bruce is a mentor to everyone that works in the mailroom, as well as the boss. And um, I just think um, more people need need help. And and when you see someone that's overtly not as healthy as you, then that's distressing. I wish we had a way to help to help them. Once Jim and I were having um, lunch in not too far from here, and we saw this young man who was probably 18 or 19, and he just walked down on the sidewalk, and he was clearly out of it. We thought he was probably psychotic, and you know, I, we were busy and, you know, I just always felt guilty afterwards that we didn't somehow help him because I felt like he looked like he was in the same shape Jim was when he was first sick when he was in college. But yet we just didn't help him because we, we weren't quite sure what to do. And here we are people who have a lot of experience that should know sometimes who we could call or who we could help. But the mental health system is very mysterious and disjointed and and um, we need a lot more resources and education. It takes, a lot, it takes a lot of time to invest in somebody um, to try to help model the illness. I've tried to help people, but now I'm getting paid for it as a boss. That's nice, because I used to do a lot of it on my own. And it's, yeah, it's a big investment to try to save, save somebody from a bad condition. It's a big, it's a huge investment. Do you really want to do that? Well, some people do and some people don't. And I feel like sometimes, you know, I've got 
my son Jim, you know, who's my big investment. And, yeah. And how many more uh, people can I help in a concerted way? Well, that's you can give advice, yeah. but that's really wise. If you really want to help somebody, you have to hang with them for a long time. Yeah. And you only have so much time. Yeah. So it's, uh, we do what we can, and that's as good as we can. So I guess maybe thank you, everybody, and thanks yeah. for that last question. And um, I guess we'll go up and, and sign books if there's anyone here who doesn't have half the books already. Which yeah, is most of you already, I recognize a lot of you yeah. that already have the books. So. Well, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.